We have to radically rethink what this is all about. Do these arguments disprove the resurrection? That's why we'll go back to the resurrection next Sunday. But as I said, I just want to look at the evidence and help you decide. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, include the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion. All four don't describe the process in detail, but we know an awful lot about it from historical and archaeological evidence. Crucifixion was so bad and brutal that even the Romans sometimes felt sorry for those who had to undergo it. And in fact, history suggests that uh, crucifixion was reserved for non-Romans only. They wouldn't do that to somebody of their own uh, creed, as it were. The idea behind crucifixion chiefly was to suppress rebellions against the Roman government. And all along the highways and byways, there would be crosses. Crucifixion didn't happen just on that Good Friday with three men being crucified. Thousands upon thousands of men were crucified. It was so brutal, they didn't even have a word to describe it. So they had to invent a word to describe just how horrifyingly painful and brutal it was. It's where we get the word excruciating. Ex meaning out of, crucio there from the cross. Out of the cross. Now just let me let that sink in for a moment. Excruciating. They had to come up with a whole new word to describe the pain caused by crucifixion. Now, I don't know what that says to you. It says to me how horrible this thing must have been. But it also helps me understand something else. Do you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? And do you remember he was agonizing over what was coming? And he was praying to God, you know, if there's any way that I don't have to go through this, please take it away from me. But not what I want, what you want, Father. And it says in Luke's Gospel, he was a doctor, it says there that Jesus quite literally sweated drops of blood. He was agonizing so much over the idea of what he was going to go through that it caused this medical condition called hemodidrosis. And uh, you can look it up for yourself if you want, a well-known uh, and attested to medical condition where chemicals in the body under stress are released and uh, in, they go into the capillaries and the sweat glands. The chemicals break down and your sweat glands produce uh, sweat tinged with blood, quite literally. Happens under extreme conditions. So what Luke records for us happening in the Garden of Gethsemane is true, I would say. Jesus is so anxious about what he's going to go through. He's under immeasurable amount of stress as he thought about the pain he was going to endure and the whole thing of what it was going to mean to die for humanity, wrestling with and agonizing over the separation that would come from his father. And then, of course, the Romans get hold of him. He's arrested in the garden, he's taken away, and as part of their justice system and the crucifixion process, they used to whip those who were going to be crucified. A whip made of leather with metal balls and bones woven into it to help tear the skin of the victim. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It was barbaric. The lashing would normally be for 40 whips, but depending on a soldier's mood, we know it could possibly go on for more. It's well known that even during the process of flogging, many a person died. It was also the Roman custom to mock those that were being whipped and prepared for crucifixion. And you remember, if you read in the Bible, you'll read of Jesus being dressed up in a purple robe and having a crown of thorns to put on his head. And they mocked him. 
goading him as being royal. We don't like to talk about this. But this is the reality of what we're talking about when it comes to the idea Jesus died. Hammer. Nails. Not little tacks that you and I use to put pictures up at home. Serious nails. After flogging, the victim would be required to carry a horizontal beam from the prison to the place of execution. The beam would weigh about 45 kilos, what's that, about 100 pounds? Resting on the lower neck and upper spine, areas of the body which had obviously been whipped. If the victim fell to the ground exhausted, they could severely hurt their head because they had no means of catching themselves. And then they would be nailed. Nailed by the feet and the wrists. Doctors believe that when victims were hung on the cross that their arms stretched six inches. Death on the cross was painful, barbaric, slow. They would use their feet to try and push up to catch their breath. Lack of oxygen, erratic heartbeat, cardiac arrest would soon ensue. There was a 0% survival rate from crucifixion. People did not come down from the cross. Now the soldiers may not have known all the scientific terms for what was going on with the victims, but by the time they get to him, it seems they know Jesus is dead. We know that because it was a common practice to break the legs of victims. They did it regularly. But instead with Jesus, we understand that they pierced his side. And from what we can read there, the combination of shock and a rapid heart rate and heart failure resulted in a clearly watery fluid around his heart and lungs. So when they pierce his side, water and blood come out. Jesus had quite literally drowned. Fakery? After considering all that death involved through crucifixion, do you think it would have been possible for somebody to fake that? Surely you'd agree this morning that all the evidence points to Jesus actually being dead. There's no way he could have faked his death. And see, for Christians, that's critical. Because Paul in Romans chapter 5 says these words, Christ demonstrates his love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, he died for us. This morning, here around this table, we come to remember Jesus. Now you may have come into this service thinking that this is just tradition. This is something we just do because for, well, quite literally thousands of years, Christians have remembered and celebrated the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But maybe this morning it takes on a new significance for you. Because this morning you've been confronted with evidence for the fact that Jesus died a brutal, painful barbaric death. And Paul in Romans chapter 5 tells us that Jesus did that for us. Because he loves us. Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus suffering all of that agony on the cross, if this is true... He did it for you. And this evidence demands a verdict from us. We can't just let that hang there. If, as we'll see next week, the conclusion of it all is that the pinnacle of Christian faith is that not only did Jesus die, but he came back alive again, then we've got an honest decision to make. Because if that's true, it changes everything. 
So as we come to this table this morning, let's reflect together on the evidence that Jesus died a barbaric death for you and for me. That people may challenge the idea that he died because so often they're fearful of what it might mean if he came back alive. But as a Christian, I believe firmly the evidence makes sense. He died and he rose again. That's what we're coming to celebrate as we come to eat bread and drink wine this morning. To help us continue reflecting on these things, we're going to sing a song that talks about the cross of Jesus and helps us to prepare for eating and drinking bread and wine this morning. Can I invite you please to stand and we'll sing, My Lord, what love is this?
So uh, now and again, uh, we have the privilege of being able to welcome into membership here those who've uh, come to trust Jesus, uh, for whom the reality of his death has impacted their lives and they've decided to put their faith, their hope, their trust uh, into him. And they've witnessed and testified to that through the waters of baptism. And uh, sometimes they move to different churches and things and they feel that that's going to be their spiritual home and that's where they want to acknowledge God's work in them and in the wider family. So sometimes as a pastor you get to do nice things like that. And this morning it's doubly nice because it's my own daughter. So Catherine, come and join me here please as uh, we welcome you into membership. So get your pyjamas on. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Hang on. You've got to do a formal bit first. Okay. Don't fold your arms. <laughs> We're now to receive Catherine into the membership of Mariah Baptist Church. And we enter into a covenant with her to share with each other in building up the church to the glory of God, working alongside one another in his service in the world and encouraging one another in the love of God. Catherine, it really is my privilege to welcome you into the membership of the church here at Moriah. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you for the different gifts and abilities you have given to people in your church. And we thank you for the reality of what you've done in Catherine's life over many years. And that you've brought her to this point of seeking to make her spiritual home here at Moriah. So we want to pray you'll bless her. And we want to pray that she'll be a blessing to us. And that together, as the body of Christ here at Moriah, we'll be able to serve you and honour you. Thank you for those gifts that she already has. And thank you for those that you want to develop. So Lord, we pray your blessing and encouragement upon this young life. And that you will watch over her and guard her. And be a blessing to her, now and always. Amen. Catherine, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Oh, God. Oh. Can I invite the deacons to join me, please? So we come to this table, not because we must, but because we may. We come because the evidence is beyond contradiction. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we come not because we're strong, but because we're weak, not because we have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because... As sinners, we stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. The Lord Jesus instituted this supper as something we do in remembrance of him. And so John's going to give thanks for bread and what it symbolizes.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to come before this table to celebrate the Last Supper. We pray, Lord, that I will bless each and every one that's gathered here this morning, that we will come before you with contrite hearts, and you will bless each and every one of us. We ask a blessing, O Father, on the bread, which we will partake shortly of, a symbol of your body that was broken on that cross, as we've just heard in all that torture and difficulty, that you gave your life for our sins and that we might live. We thank you for that and for the symbol of the bread. We pray that thou will bless each and every one that partakes through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Thank you, John. So the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to eat bread as we receive it, and we're going to give thanks to God for the body of Jesus. If you have special dietary needs, there are some rice cakes on the platters. <laughs> 